So we're in public session and this afternoon, before we uh, complete our uh, joint Iraq this report on climate action, um, we are going to hear from five students who are each going to make a two-minute presentation to give us their youth perspective perspective on the need for climate action and the schools before us this afternoon are Sancta Maria College from Lewisburg, Cranach College, Buncranach County Donegal, Temple Carrick School in Greystones, Cork Educate Together Secondary School and New Park Comprehensive um, in Black Rock. So our first contributor um, this afternoon is Theo Cullen Moose. Thank you Theo, you're very welcome. Hello, my name is Theo Cullen Moose and I've grown up on a farm. Uh, on Clare Island in County Mayo. Our offshore community has already seen the evidence of climate change in a very real and frightening way. I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me, us here to speak today and I would like to thank you for your work on combating climate change. You're taking some first, step, first steps in the right direction. The unfortunate truth, however, is that even though progress is being made and even though Irish politicians have largely been very supportive of the climate strikes, we are still not doing enough. The Oireachtas Climate Action Report is definitely a step in the right direction. But we can't afford to just take steps anymore. We need to make a leap. Even if every single one of the recommendations outlined by this committee were to be implemented by the government, we would still fall short of our targets. Perhaps not our official, internationally agreed upon ones, but our moral and ethical ones. Ireland is a prosperous, developed nation which is heralded throughout Europe as an example of how globalization can benefit peripheral states in the 21st century. And in recent years, Ireland has undergone progressive social change. I am proud to call myself Irish because of this. However, what use is a more progressive, fairer society if society itself ceases to exist? This is not an overdramatization of the facts. The IPCC report uh, from last year is quite clear. If we do not act now, my generation and the generations to come will suffer. Additionally, I find the repeated appeals by this committee to highlight the positive benefits of climate action rather than the neg negative consequences of inaction to be quite su surprising and indeed dispiriting. Climate action does indeed have benefits, benefits which I would argue will doubtlessly exceed the costs. But it is vital that we do not forget why we need climate action. One of the main reasons we are in a desperate situation that we are in now is because of the apathy and a general lack of awareness surrounding the issue. And do not for a second think that we are not in a desperate situation. It is vital that we communicate to this to the public and trying to obscure this fact is not only deceptive, it is downright irresponsible. Today, our generation is saying, we demand you stop taking baby steps. Take a leap instead. Lead us to the future we deserve. Ireland cannot afford to wait. The planet cannot afford to wait. It's time to stop playing politics with our future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theo. And now we call on uh, Sumaya Mohammed. Hi, my name is Sumaya Mohammed, and I'm 12 years old. And I come from Cork Educate Together Secondary School. I'm in first year. I'm not in any way capable of representing over 15,000 students in the Republic of Ireland. And I'm not in any way a, po a professional speaker. I'm not here to bore you with my life story, because that's not why I've come here. You guys grew up worrying what job you'd get, how you were going to do in exams, who would you fall in love with. We, we grew up worrying the same things, but on top of that, we, we grew up worrying how long we have left to live. We, should, we, should, we, as students here, should be enjoying life, having carefree thoughts, not worrying about the future of the world. Yet we are here telling you guys how to do your job. You know the root of the problem, greediness and money being and money allowed to rule. You know the earth 
You know the Earth is already um, warmed by 1.1 degrees Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. Yet you continue to look at us, say to us that we are proud of you. But the moment you walk out of this room, the fact that you don't do anything makes us wonder. Are you thinking of your image more than you're thinking of us? So dear Leo and all the politicians, we are beyond furious. We shouldn't have to be doing this. We shouldn't be giving up one of our basic human rights, educate we shouldn't have to be giving up one of our basic human rights, education, to clean up your mess. It shouldn't have to come to only having 11 years to drastically change what is happening to the earth. You give us compliments on how amazing it is that school children are standing up for their futures. You said you were inspired and enthused. But your compliments are worthless to us without action. We signed up to the Paris Agreement, yet by the looks of it, everyone has forgotten. We are Europe's laggards and it shouldn't be that way. Those of you politicians who have children, you love, their, you love your children more than anything else. But like Greta Thunberg said, you're stealing their futures right in front of their very eyes. You're seeing my future, and you have absolutely no right to do that. I'm sorry if this offends you in any way, but you have to face the reality. You aren't realizing your greediness and delay is harming our very existence. You aren't realizing that if we fail, there is no undo button. If we are capable of changing the climate, then we are definitely capable of fixing this mess. The IPCC's latest science report in October 2018 has said the next 10 years will be the most important years in history. I hope you make that count. Thank you. Thank you, Samaya. And now I call on Molly gordon Bowles to give your presentation. Hello, my name is Molly and I'm a 17-year-old student and climate activist from Temple Carrick School in Greystones. I'm here to talk about what climate change means to us as students and what needs to be done. My future, my children's future and my grandchildren's future depends entirely on what is done now. Not what is said, promised or proposed, as empty promises do not change. The only thing that changed the world is action. The earth cannot hear your words. It cannot tell you what to do. It cannot feel your confusion or denial on the topic. I am soon to be a voter, and many other young people will be too, so you need to listen to your electorate. There is such a blindness when it comes to climate change. People have this mentality that if it's not affecting them, it doesn't matter. I hope it doesn't come down to another global disaster like the recent cyclone in Mozambique for actions to take place. This is, the, oh, this is only one example of the consequences of climate change. Our actions have affected the lives of 1.85 million Mozambicans, caused the death of over 500 vulnerable people, <clears throat> destroyed over 33,000 houses, damaged 500,000 hectares of crops and devastated families, but still nothing is being done and we only have 11 and a half years until climate change becomes irreversible. Climate change is not just a problem for politicians to tackle. It is not just an issue that adults must tackle. It is not a problem that young people should be stuck with dealing alone. We need every single human on earth to recognise that this is an emergency and to do that we need to declare one. We are told that action is taking place but even paper straws come in plastic packaging. Agriculture, energy and transport industries accounted for 72.5% of greenhouse gas emissions in 2015. For 2020, Ireland was given a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 20% below what they were in 2005. We are currently in target to reduce emissions by less than 1% come 2020. This is going to result in over 600 million euro in fines. You may think that hope is lost, that we've pushed it aside for too long, but that only makes the problem worse. We must accept that this is happening and we need to do something about it now. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And now we're going to hear from Connell O'Boyle. Hello, uh, my name's Connell O'Boyle. I'm 16 and I'm from Moffin, County Donegal. 
My brother Shan and I made the journey from Donegal to be here this week, and we need to cross the border twice, and there's uncertainty over what that border is going to look like. It's not the change of accent or even the Union Jack colours painted on the curbs that let you know that you're in Northern Ireland, but it is the solar panels, the windmills and progressive infrastructure that really do let you know where you are. Thirty years ago, it would not have been as possible to travel with such ease. And now, as Brexit looms, we hope what we're saying here today isn't drowned out by the terms backstop, common travel area or trade union. We hear enough about that where we live in Muff. In the past few years, it seems that everything has been about Brexit and nothing has been about climate change, which I can tell you all sitting here is far more important than Brexit. The reality is that there is no progressive infrastructure in the North West that I can see, and I am sure that this is a reflection on the rest of the country. This is what we want. We want this progressive infrastructure. We want physical and eye-catching infrastructure. We want windmills, we want solar panels, we want houses to be retrofitted, and we want to see an Ireland that will be carbon neutral by 2030. We need more public transport, and we need it to be for free. I saw a picture on Twitter recently that showed the train systems of the world's major cities, Paris, New York and London, all with the lines that zigzagged each other that was impossible to keep up. And then there was a diagram of Dublin. It showed one green line and one red line, with a black dotted line in between them saying, you can walk yourself. Now, I know that's a bit outdated, but I'm sure you understand the point I'm trying to make. About six years ago, I was at the Red Cross Centre in Muff, which before that was a customs post uh, when our Red Cross leader, Bernie Rutherford, told us that children who were aged three years old at the time were the last generation of people who could do anything before it was out of human hands. My brother was that age at that time, and he's nine years old today, and Bernie's message has stayed with me through him. We hope the message, that, uh, we hope the message of over 10,000 young people on Molesworth Street on the 15th of March, and over 15,000 people nationwide, and 1.3 million people around the world, we hope that our message has come through these thick walls of Leinster House. It would be naive of me to believe that one protest will be enough to save the world, and that's why the protests will continue. The children are doing all they can to make sure the men and women in positions of power, like yourselves, can hear us. We cannot vote, but that does not mean that our voices will be silenced. A wave is coming, and this is the beginning of a climate action revolution. In time, me, the people in the gallery up there, and the ones sitting behind me will all be able to vote, and we'll be able to rock the system to the core, and when we do, you will know about it. Thanks. Thank you, Connell. And our final speaker this afternoon is Keane Parry. So I think everyone who's spoken before me has highlighted, first of all, that the harrowing danger uh, that our generation faces into the coming decades, as well as the appetite among young people to really change things. I think the reason in particular why Greta Thunberg inspired not only 15,000 people in Ireland, but also 1.3 million students globally to strike from school, and what was probably the biggest school student strike in history, was the fact that she didn't sugarcoat things. She didn't say, everything's going to be okay, because we're going to sort it out, we're going to agree to this at this conference, we're going to agree to that at that committee. She said we are doing catastrophic damage to our climate and ecosystems, and we are in big trouble. It is also worth remembering that our Taoiseach, uh, on the day of the strike, said he found the school strikers inspiring. The Minister for the Environment attended the march on the day. Yet I think I can say that all of us here were extremely disappointed when, the, when, when his government hypocritically voted against the Climate Emergency Measures Bill. Uh, even to stay under two degrees of global warming, we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground. So I put to those present here who did vote against the Climate Emergency Bill to give us a good explanation on why you did so. Thank you.
on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you all for coming before us. I think your timing here this, this afternoon is very important for us as we sign off on this cross-party report, which I hope um, and I, I feel will meet your expectations because what you want now is action. And that's what we are doing here on a cross-party basis, not just for this government, but for future governments in order to reach our climate uh, targets. So thank you for coming before us. You all spoke so articulately. I know every, I, you could hear a pin drop here in the room. I think the most silent um, session we've had here um, throughout our seven months uh, of meetings. So we look forward to engaging with you in the future. This standing committee will continue and we will hold the Oireachtas and the government to account in, in relation to implementing these actions. So I think you all deserve a big round of applause. We can adjourn if members are agreeable for 15 minutes. Thank you. Number of deferred votes to take before resuming consideration of the recommendations in Chapter 6, and these will now be taken uh, consequentially after the division bells have rang, and we'll wait for the eight minutes. So, if members are agreeable, we've we have discussed them yesterday. So, what we'll do is, if they are being pressed, we'll ring the bells for eight minutes and take the three together. So I'll just go through them. Amendment 45 is in the name of Deputy Ryan, inserting a new recommendation on speed limits. The question, oh yeah, and then this, there's another one after that. Uh, Amendment 46 in the name of Deputy Smith, inserting a new recommendation on free public transport. And then the third one is Amendment 35 in the name of Deputy Smith, inserting a new recommendation on taxing agri-food producers. So there are the three. So the first one, Amendment number 45 in the name of Deputy Ryan, inserting a new recommendation on speed limits. Uh, the, the question is that the new recommendation be inserted in the report. Um, all those in favour say tall. tall. All those against say Neil. Neil. I think the question is lost. So we will ring the bells for eight minutes.
the meeting to order. As eight minutes have lapsed, the doors shall now be locked and the division will now be taken. So on the question, recommendation 45 stands part of the report. A division has been challenged and pursuant to standing orders, the division will now be taken by the clerk to the committee. Okay, uh, Deputy Mary Butler. This is, um, so this is from yesterday. This is uh, the Green Party Amendment number 45 in relation to speed limits. Deputy Jack Chambers. Deputy Marcella Cochran Kennedy. Neil. Deputy Colin Brophy for Deputy Deering. Neil. Deputy Timmy Dooley. Neil. Deputy Martin Hayden. Neil. Deputy Lahart, not here. Okay. Deputy Munster. Stay. Deputy Breed Smith. Paul. Deputy Nocton. Neil. Deputy Neville. Neil. Deputy Nolan isn't here. Deputy Pringle. Deputy Eamon Ryan. Oh. Deputy Sean Sherlock. Oh. Deputy Brian Stanley. Okay, and the senators, Senator Paul Daly. Neil. Senator Maura Devine. Abstain. Senator Tim Lombard. Neil. Senator Ian Marshall. Neil. Senator Michelle Mulhern. Neil. And Senator Grace O'Sullivan. Oh. Okay, that's grand. Thaw 5, Neil 12, abstain 3, the question is lost. So now we're going to move straight on to the next um, amendment, which is amendment number 46 in the name of Deputy Smith, inserting a new recommendation on free public transport. The question is that the new recommendation be inserted into the report, and on that question a division has been challenged and the division will now be taken. Okay, so it's, Free transport. it's on the screen. It's on the screen. It's, there. it's, number, it's, number, it's number 46. Do you see it there in green on the, the middle one? The Commission recommends the government make a commitment yeah. to introducing public transport. Free public transport is a long term goal to help reduce CO2. Right, Deputy Butler. Deputy Jack Chambers. Have I said that? Deputy Marcella Cochran Kennedy. Deputy Colin Brophy. Deputy Timmy Dooley. Deputy Martin Hayden. Neil. Deputy Lahart is missing. Uh, Deputy Munster. Oh. Deputy Breed Smith. Oh. Deputy Hildegard Nocton. Neil. Deputy Tom Neville. Neil. Deputy Karen Nolan is missing. Uh, Deputy Thomas Pringle. Oh. Deputy Eamon Ryan. Oh. Deputy Sean Sherlock. Oh. Deputy Brian Stanley. Oh. And the Senator, Senator Paul Daly. Neil. Senator Maura Devine. Oh. Senator Tim Lombard. Neil. Senator Ian Marshall. Neil. Senator Michelle Mulhern. Neil. And Senator Grace O'Sullivan. Okay, just, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, top, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, so, Thaw 8, Neil 12, the question is lost. We will now move to deal with amendment number 37 in the name of Deputy Smith, inserting a new recommendation on taxing agri-food producers. The question is that the new recommendation be inserted in the report and on that question a division has been challenged and the division will now be taken. Chair, sure, we just ask that uh, yesterday we discussed this, there were some suggestions from around the, the committee that we would refer this to the standing committee. Um, and there seem to be a number of people in favour of that. Yeah, and I'm just saying this yeah, by we way can of, always do that. I'm saying that by way of being helpful because yeah, I we think we felt do that with anything, there's very different views, but also we felt that we didn't have enough evidence to come down one, one way or the other on it. Or to well, there's some people who proposal. clearly were against this, actually, and I didn't, I didn't allow right. many members to come uh, in because there was a vote in the Shannon, yeah. and many senators actually did want to contribute on yeah. this matter, and that's I correct. knew that uh, they were against it, and that's why I held off on the vote, because many senators had gone to the vote. I know that members are... We, I'm just 
conscious that we want to move on today with the report, but there was many who were in strong disagreement with this, and that's Absolutely. why I deferred it until today, Deputy. So um, I think we can discuss anything uh, in relation to the uh, Standing Committee. So can we proceed with the vote on this? Thank you. Deputy Buckler. Yeah. Okay. Deputy Chambers. Yeah. Deputy Marcella Corcoran Kennedy. Yeah. Deputy Colin Brophy. Yeah. Deputy Timmy Dooley. Yeah. Deputy Martin Hayden. Yeah. Deputy Le Hart is missing. Uh, Deputy Munster. Yes. Deputy Breed Smith. Oh. Deputy Hildegard Nocton. Neil. Deputy Tom Neville. Neil. Deputy Karen Nolan is missing. Deputy Pringle. Oh. Deputy Eamon Ryan. Oh. Deputy Sean Sherlock. Neil. Deputy Brian Stanley. Okay. And then the Senators. Senator Paul Daly. Neil. Senator Maura Devine. Senator Tim Lombard. Neil. Senator Ian Marshall. Neil. Senator Michelle Mulhern. Neil. And Senator Grace O'Sullivan. So Thaw, 4, Neil, 13, abstentions, 3, the uh, vote is lost. So now we will move to chapter, resume chapter 6. There are three recommendations in chapter 6. Recommendations 1 and 2 have no amendments. Are they agreed? Agreed. Recommendation 3. So there are a number of amendments proposed for this and can I start with, I understand there is a, a cross-party amendment. Deputy Julie, do you want to speak to this amendment? Yeah, I had raised some very considerable concerns here over the last number of days about the idea of the introduction of a carbon tax without the appropriate uh, measures put in place to assist those people who would be affected the greatest by any increasing trajectory uh, on carbon pricing. Uh, from my perspective and from the party that I represent's perspective, we were deeply concerned that there was no clear methodology to ensure that the funds that would be raised by any carbon tax uh, would go back into the greening uh, of our economy. To that end, it was also vitally important that those people who would be affected by an increase uh, in the cost of their home heating and their fuels, those that might be referred to as those vulnerable to fuel poverty were catered for, uh, and that they wouldn't feel uh, any economic impact through the introduction uh, of uh, carbon pricing. Um, and I'm pleased enough with a, a compromise text which is now being circulated, I understand, which ensures uh, and agrees that the proceeds from carbon pricing should be ring-fenced in legislation to ensure uh, that any monies from a carbon pricing regime would not go into the general exchequer funding, so that a fund would be created, and that the monies from that fund would be used to assist people in making the transition away from fossil fuels uh, to a, towards our objective uh, to have a carbon-neutral society. And in addition to that, uh, that there should only that the implementation of carbon pricing trajectory should only be implemented when an evidence-based plan is in place to increase supports and incentives for climate action measures, including the protection of those vulnerable to fuel poverty. Um, and that wording is now in the circulated text, and I'm, I'm prepared to uh, to accept. Um, or to, to answer any questions, if, if any exist. Senator Devine, you indicated to come in. Yeah, I was just a, a technical question. It said um, cross-party. Who else is the other party to this? So, well, there's, uh, I so, will let people yeah. contribute who want to... Yes, yeah, OK. Uh, Deputy Sherlock, do you want to come in? Or do, you, do, you, do you want to say something else? No, Senator, I just want to know what I would like to have known. If people in, are saying it's cross-party, it's the first time I've known of this, so... Okay. Senator, uh, sorry, Deputy Sherlock. I don't have any more. I know. 
Chair. It's new. We'll get you more. We'll get you. Have you? Just, do, yes. Chair, just get you another copy of it here. And it's up on the screen as well. Well, it's uh, only on the screen just now. The second. It's not on the paper. Yeah, paper. there was a yeah. missed a yeah. typo there, Deputy Sherlock. Do I need to? I, I can explain that there was a little bit of, uh, as is the uh, case, I suppose, in these matters where one is trying to arrive at a common position. Um, you know that you seek to find some some sort of compromise for which you find seek to find a majority or, or a consensus uh, and just on w while we're talking technically about amendments that are on the table to be agreed or to be voted upon uh, we have uh, two uh, very specific amendments uh, amendments 26 and 27 and on the basis of the agreed text that has now come forward agreed by ourselves, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, uh, 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 and Greens, that we uh, are now happy to withdraw our amendments on the basis that we feel that, there is, that the issue of fuel poverty and ensuring that mechanisms are put in place to ensure that there is a, a dealing with the issue of, you know, the, the uh, how carbon taxes would affect those people who are in fuel impoverished houses, that there is a mechanism put in place so that they are protected, so that the most vulnerable people are protected. And we feel that we can sign up to this compromise. And on that basis, at this stage, I'm quite happy to withdraw uh, 26 and 27. Okay, so they're withdrawn. Deputy Hayden. Chair, yes, just in relation to this um, new amendment, uh, to say that there's a key points in this that are very important for us in, in Fine Gael, um, would be the trajectory around carbon pricing is an element that we have always talked about giving certainty uh, to individuals, to businesses, and to remind people again that carbon pricing increasing over time to, to, to 2030 is not a revenue raising measure, it's a measure designed to change all of our behaviour, how we live. Uh, we have plenty of carrot and all of these elements need an element to stick as well and we would hope that this will change people away and they will make decisions knowing that that trajectory is there and giving certainty for them to be able to plan accordingly and that's how we see that as, as so important. Mm -hmm. Carbon pricing is only one element of a suite of measures um, to, to, to address areas in that. Another key priority for us in Fine Gael has been the area of consultation and that's why um, that within this here uh, is very, very important to us. We want key engagement across all sectors, from town hall meetings to tidy towns groups to uh, local branches and county executives of farming organisations uh, to environmental organisations. We want as much consultation and engagement as possible in a short, sharp period that we get buy-in into how any increased revenue is best used to uh, have the impact we want to have, and that's where the ring fencing then element of it, uh, to make sure that these are all for climate action measures are so important to us as well. Uh, when we started out on this journey last July, we were acutely aware that 21 politicians from different backgrounds across uh, a variety of different views were very unlikely to agree on everything. But I think there is an acceptance among uh, a lot of us, and I know I'll just speak on behalf of my own colleagues, this is the issue of our generation, without a shadow of a doubt. This is the issue that a solution to which will take a lot more than the electoral cycle, uh, that is four to five years, and in that regard, consensus is very important to us and that's why we're willing to agree to this. Uh, we're not happy about every little thing as nobody will be. Uh, there will be elements of uh, certain things you would like a little bit more of but the art of compromise is absolutely key um, in politics and for an issue this important, uh, the consequences of which go way beyond the electoral cycle, beyond the next general election and others, it is really important I think that we have that consensus in as far as possible across the political divide uh, and that's why we're agreeing uh, to this amendment here. Thank you Deputy. Anyone else to come in? Deputy Ryan? I agree with the two previous speakers and I think it is very important and significant and it's a good day for Irish climate policy when there is clear agreement, sorry, not, among a certain number of parties there is different views which is perfectly re um, valid but among those parties um, there is agreement that we, we, are, we will raise the price, we, we accept the advice of the Climate Advisory Council and will raise the um, carbon price to 80 euros a tonne at least that by, by 2030. And I think secondly there's real importance in the clear commitment that we're ring fencing any revenue for, we still have to decide whether it's a hypothecation, 
or whether it's a dividend that is returned to the citizens. And I would argue that there's real advantages in that latter option in protecting particularly those in lower incomes. And it has real advantages as well in terms of it is a, there's a benefit. If you're saving, you're getting more net cash gain from it, saving energy. If there are proposals on how hypothecation works better, that's what we need to work out in the next few months in a, in a plan. And we should be open to different options. If someone else comes, out, some, come, comes up with a brilliant version of what we could do with the money, that should be, shouldn't be turned, ruled out. But I think that's significant. It's absolutely cast iron if, if, if this consensus is, makes its way into government decision. Not just this government, but it probably may be a future government, depends on who gets elected. But that's a significant gain for environmental policy, in my mind, that the revenues, it's not a tax to raise money, it's a tax to give a signal and to help in the climate action that we need to take. And thirdly, with regard to the kind of the new amendments that's, that's come through, uh, I think tying this to an evidence-based plan makes rational and obvious sense. The, um, we have to do that plan under law. European law, the European governance package, which was agreed, sets out that we have to have a national energy and climate action plan by the end of the year. That's a plan that has to direct what we're going to do over the next 10 years to 2030. So, of course, we have to do this. And, uh, but it's, and I think our work now, the work from this committee from here to the end of the year, is to assist the government in the development of that plan and to open up that process as the EU governance system encourages. And actually, our system, what we've done in this committee, I think is probably one of the exemplar models within the European Union, if you talk to European Commission officials, about how parliaments could engage in that process. We have started really well by having a citizens' assembly, by going into committee hearing public sessions, by going into our own private sessions. That's a good process. So those three gains are really, really good and significant. The one risk, I fear, is because this is such a politically contentious it's the mission that the media love more than anything else. They'll never talk to you about governance or climate systems or about retrofitting. It's not that sexy. Or, you know, changing land use and peatland restoration, which is where we could do the real big carbon savings. Does, it's hard to get on the, on the six o'clock news. We do not need this to become carbon tax, to become the political football just bouncing around for the next 10 years, and certainly not the next six months. And there's a real risk in the next six months, we all know it, we're going to a budget that's going to be tough politically, potentially. And I don't want carbon tax to be the middle of that. I think we have a chance here to give certainty, to get it kind of sense, to get it out from the political game into policy that, that, that helps us. And it's not the key measure. It, it, it'll give us a margin, it'll give us a, maybe 10%, whatever, 15% of what we need to do. But given that we, we have a 70% gap, 10% is significant. I have one variation, if I sorry for going off for a slightly long chair, but I was going to finish with one amendment, further amendment if I can, or to put that in that chapter in the second page where it says, in view of the above, that the Minister of Finance should set out a carbon price projection that rises to eight euros per tonne by 2030. Um, there's a, if, if people can see that uh, yeah. chapter, I don't know if people have it on the screen, or it's the second paragraph down in the second page of the draft amendment as, as I've been presented. Um, that the Minister of Finance should set out a carbon price trajectory that rises to 80, ton, 80 euros per tonne by 2030. Um, to put in after the, the, that the Minister of Finance should set out a compromise price trajectory that, um, start, uh, that starting in 2020 rises to 80 euros per tonne by 2030. So that, and I think there's been clear agreement on that. And well, maybe those who don't agree in the carbon tax don't agree it should be, you know, in any year. But those of us who've been arguing in favour of this approach, my understanding throughout our negotiations, deliberations, there's been common agreement that, yeah, we, you know, this is something we'll start now this year. And I suppose having heard our students here, and some of them are glad to see us still in the public gallery here today, answering their call, we act now. We, we, we start this year. We don't wait 12 years. We, we 12 years. Why? And the difficulty is if we don't start it next year, we all know in politics that not, the year after that ain't going to be any easier. In fact, this is probably a moment in time more than any other moment in time because of those climate strikes putting pressure on us that we could get over the line. So I just put that amendment down that we would start, make sure that we're clear on that, start in 2020. And other than that, I think it is, and this, our party backs the, backs the proposal. I have another spe uh, other speakers who've indicated, Deputy Stanley. 
I'm just uh, a bit, I suppose I'm a bit disappointed that, you know, for the last eight months the committee has operated in a very collaborative way and literally overnight how the committee operates has changed. Uh, yeah. In that there's a, what we're told is, an all-party or cross-party amendment being submitted, a substantial one. Uh, the first sight we have had of it is now. Um, and uh, that, that flies in the face of how things have worked to date. And as the, the Vice Chairperson of the Committee, I just want to express my disappointment yeah. with that. Um, the, the amendment in front of us, obviously, uh, is to give some cover to Fianna Fáil in relation to what's, what's happening here. Um, we have set out our case in relation to this, and there's now another proposed amendment to the amendment. We have an amendment, we have an amendment that we want to put here today, if these amendments are going to be allowed here to go before the committee, and I'm proposing that these, committees be, or that these amendments be allowed. Um, this is going ahead uh, a decision to increase, and we want to, we want to change how things are done. We want to change how the amount of CO2 emissions being pumped into the atmosphere. But we also know, we also know from the evidence that we've heard over the last eight months and back beyond that, and indeed it was on the previous committee here, uh, on, the climate action, on the Climate Committee in the last hall, where we brought in legislation, and our party, Sinn Féin, actually sought stronger legislation that had binding sectoral targets in it. We didn't achieve that, unfortunately. Um, but the, the facts are is that you know, we're, we're, uh, we're simply, what we're doing here today is we're given the green light to further increase carbon tax after the increase a few years ago. Uh, and in effect, with the VAT and all on top of it, what we're talking about here is we're talking about two euros and fifty on a bale of briquettes, on a bag of fuel, we're talking about in the region of uh, 12 euros of an increase. Now, we, we want to move away from fossil fuels, and we've spoken at length here about this, and we've backed. There's a lot of good stuff in the report, and there's nine chapters of the report, a lot of the stuff we met proposals and fed into it in a very constructive and collaborative way. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff in there to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in them to, uh, to do things in a more sustainable way, which have we you must do. Have you an amendment, Deputy? Have you an amendment you want and, to call out to us that we can consider? I will. Consider I'll come to it in a minute. I just, yep. If you allow me now, because the previous yep. speaker has got a fair shot at no, this. No, no, I, I just... And, yep. you know, we've just been handed this, yep, this amendment, so I think that we're at least we're entitled to respond uh, to that. Um, but the point, the point we would make there is, is that without, without most people in the country at this point as having the means of adopting, and that's the point here, there's also the issue of the border. And the border, if there's carbon taxes one side of the border being increased and they're not increased at the other side of the border, I think that needs to be considered. There's also the fact, it's been mentioned about being ring-fenced. Well, I listened very carefully to Pascal Donoghue about the sugar tax and whether it could be ring-fenced or not and used for health purposes. And those of you that took the time to listen to him will have heard the answer very, very clearly. And maybe someone in the government party wants to challenge that, I don't know. But the facts are, yeah. is that as we, as we sit here to discuss this, the poorest of households, the poorest of households uh, are not insulated. The poorest of households do not have the means to retrofit. We have a very, very weak public transport system, uh, particularly when you, get, when you get beyond the M50. And, you know, we have businesses that are struggling day to day with higher costs upon costs upon costs, with rates, energy costs. And I would remind, I would remind the, 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 the committee here that our electricity prices and our energy costs have risen by an average of 24 per cent in the last, in the, in the last few years, 10 per cent, over 10 per cent since last, since last August. And this needs to be considered. Our renters, the people who are renting homes, over 300,000 homes in the state, the most, the most poorly insulated houses, with the most inefficient and most expensive, most expensive means of heating them. What happens to those people? Where is the protection for those people in this? So we want to put forward, we're proposing an amendment here, 
And the amendment we are proposing is on, for Chapter 6, page 43, and it's very straightforward. We propose that all references to carbon tax increases be deleted from the document and that a single recommendation be made to Chapter 6 that no increase in carbon tax be made. So I'm formally proposing a motion. Okay. My next speaker here on my list is Senator Devine. Um, yeah, um, I suppose we, we have worked collaboratively and it's been a great experience. Um, but it's a, a, at three o'clock then you come into this room and you find out uh, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, Labour and the Green Party have been conniving, perhaps is the word, um, in that it's not a cross-party amendment, it's an amendment by those four uh, parties to an attempt, I think, to an alienate the portion, perhaps of Sinn Féin and maybe one or two others in this room, but to alienate us. Look, I'm, I'm used to, I'm comfortable with the alienation. I don't mind it because it just goes over my head. What I am not comfortable with is the alienation of the people that we represent, who we have widely consulted with, and you didn't even bother to consult with us in this, in, in this amendment. We are here about social justice, and that is why, and you cannot turn around and say to us that we as a party are uh, somehow not doing our environmental patriotic bit, that somehow we are against the greening of our economy, the greening of our nation, the greening of all our lives. I want to second uh, Deputy Stanley's amendment. Carbon pricing, carbon tax, whatever the word you want to put on it, is not, is, is, is not within my view uh, progressive, it is regressive and it hurts the people that we most need to protect and the people that will protect our country and our planet but we are absolutely punishing them, punishing them, blaming them and giving them guilt and I think you need to take that on board. Very disappointing, it is not socially justifiable to bring in a carbon tax and that is why I'm quite passionate about this but uh, thanks for including us in the, uh, in the collaborative cross-party discussions. I'm very upset, thank you. Uh, Deputy Smith, you're next on my list. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've listened to the discussion yet again around this and again I'll reiterate I, I, I think it is like Henry Ford telling you you can have any colour car you want as long as it's black because no matter how you rephrase or restructure this, uh, this mechanism inside the document what you're still saying is that ordinary people will be, uh, have an increase on the carbon tax, will be address their, their personal, their individual behaviour will be addressed by taxing it. But in line with that, we refuse to look at the behaviour or the, uh, the, the, the recklessness of agribusiness and the fossil fuel industry. So I suppose many of you saw the, the reports in the papers on two things. One from the International Energy Agency telling us that global emissions hit record levels in the last half of last year, they rose by 1.7%. And like it was said to us earlier on in a very um, striking manner by the young people, we need to take leaps, not baby steps. And all we're doing here by increasing carbon tax on ordinary people is a baby step. It is n there's no leap in it. The other uh, report in the paper is probably even more interesting in terms of the argument I'm making is that several leading Irish companies have been named and shamed for not reporting their greenhouse gas emissions to CDP, a not-for-profit organisation which measures the uh, company's impact on the environment. And it highlighted prominent names including Paddy Power Betfair, Ryanair, Permanent TSB, Total Produce and Apple Green for not responding to their emissions survey. So we're very concerned about the individual behaviour of the people who are rightly identified in some of the paragraphs as suffering from fuel poverty, and you don't have to be on fuel allowance to suffer from fuel poverty. We've gone through that, we've gone through that argument time and time again. We want to conduct surveys on it. We want reports nationally on it. That's all very correct. Uh, but we do not want to deal with the issue that is glaringly obvious. Industry and agribusiness on a big level have more to answer for than the individual behaviour of my constituents or indeed your constituents, Chairperson. And yet that's all we seem to have in our sights. Um, I, I, I do want to say that the process, never mind what happened here today, but what was even more uh, kind of a smack in the gob to me was that after we've heard all our evidence for this committee, 
A report was dropped in here to justify carbon tax. A report that actually I have a lot of contention with. I'll just repeat it here today. It was a report drafted and, and, and put together by economists, not by environmentalists, not by scientists, to justify, wrongly in my view, why carbon tax works. And other evidence to counter that, which does exist, there are many reports of a global nature, of an international nature, which exist to show that carbon tax actually, um, um, Deputy Ryan, doesn't reduce emissions by more than 1 to 2 per cent. Carbon tax fails when it comes to the reduction of emissions. The, the reduction that it yields is very, very limited compared to the reduction we will get from the other measures that we want. And, and people here are saying this is not a revenue-raising measure, but yet they go on to talk about how we can spend it. If it's about changing behaviour, why are we not looking at changing the behaviour of those who are, are, are committing the biggest mortal sins when it comes to the emissions uh, across the planet? We're not going to deal with that. Too controversial. That would be a leap, by the way. That wouldn't be a step. That would be a leap. And that's a political leap that people around this committee don't seem to be willing to take at all. Um, now, I just want to make one point about the procedure here. I'm requesting an adjournment to go away and read this because I want to take it serious. It's just landed in front of me. I haven't had time to scrutinise it. I want an adjournment to consider it. But I also want to flag up to the committee that the measure that's in the second last paragraph, that the government conduct uh, a, a, measure to, a, a survey on fuel poverty across all cohorts, and that review uh, should show the, long and the short and medium and long-term impact of fuel poverty and the options of increase in carbon tax. Look, I mean, if you're going to stick that in there, I had a com comprehensive um, amendment that was taken out of the body of the text and put into this uh, issue on carbon tax. So it puts me as an opponent of carbon tax on ordinary people into the position of voting against this entire amendment, which includes my amendment. I think it is grossly unfair that that amendment on fuel poverty, which I introduced to the committee, it should stand alone, it should be decoupled from carbon tax, and we should be allowed to vote on it separately, because I'm certainly not going to be compromised and put into position, after all these weeks of debate, of voting against my own amendment. Deputy Munster, you're next on my list. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just looking at the, the amendment here in front of us and um, the amendment calling or the, you know, that the government that we seek to, the government to increase supports and incentives and I'm just um, thinking was it just less than 24 hours ago that the pr proposers of this particular amendment were saying that in no way could they contemplate in any measure um, bringing in the, the increase in carbon tax until such time as these measures were put in place beforehand and now they seem to be satisfied with putting in an amendment that literally um, you know, calls the government at some future date to, to, to increase supports and incentives um, for climate action measures. Um, it's just totally contradictory in this, contradicting themselves within a 24-hour period. Um, and knowing so in the full knowledge that the government has had every opportunity and ample opportunity um, to, to provide, propose any help to provide um, alternatives. You know, when we talk about, I think what's crystal clear to everybody is that um, people do want to reduce omissions, you know, and it was, it's, it's our job, if you like, to make it feasible for them to do so. But in order to drive that behavioural change, change, we have to provide alternatives. And the government haven't done to date. There's no indication that they will to, uh, thus far. Um, if you look at, you know, if we're talking, if we're serious about this issue, then we have to invest in retrofitting homes. We have to invest in um, providing fuel alternatives. We have to invest in improving and um, improving and providing a sustainable public transport network right across the state and in every aspect of that they've they've failed dismally now I don't know who I don't know how Fianna Fáil think this will give them cover or maybe the the government have indicated when they're going to provide all of this investment and um, retrofitting of houses and maybe they'll, they'll um, tell us that but I just want to give an example right so say you're a family that lives in 
any part of rural Ireland. And your family with children, and you drive an old car, right? Um, and your house is very poorly insulated. But you need that car to get to your place of work every single day. And you need that old car to bring your, your children back and forth to school. Are you seriously suggesting, by increasing carbon tax fourfold, that you are going to assist that family? Unless the measures are there. And I would have thought that would be, we would have been progressive enough to insist, to insist that the government act in advance, in advance of any additional charges. How, if someone can explain to me how increasing the carbon tax fourfold is going to insist, is would going you, to insist. Take an interjection? Well, hold on a second. If you're going to insist, you know, how it, increasing the carbon tax fourfold is going to help that family insulate their home, how it's going to help that family, you know, be more, have their home more heat efficient, all of that sort of thing. It doesn't. And the government have never pro pro uh, proposed helping in any shape or form. And, I mean, you ought to know that yourselves. You know, they're pulling the wool over your eyes day in, day out. You want, but, you. you know, as I said from the start, you know, there is no evidence that carbon tax actually works. There's no evidence that it's, that's effective in any meaningful way. And it's the typical first go-to response to tax rather than bring in measures that would be meaningful and sincere no, no, and long lasting. That okay. And that's, okay. that's the problem. And it's Let bad policy. Finish. And, yeah. you know, it's the usual first go-to response. And it's, it's lazy you. and it's okay. knee-jerk reaction. J just in case there is any misunderstanding in relation to this term fourfold uh, carbon tax to 80 euro the 80 euro would be by the year 2030 it's not in the year 2020 just, just to because there is a sorry. perception could and I, there is a narrative out there that, that yes. fourfold I just want to clarify this mm. because I'm not saying it's you deputy but there is a, a narrative out there that fourfold increase to 80 euro is going to happen in 2020 it's not the climate change advisory council's advice was that it would be set at 80 euro by 2030 and i'm not clarifying your own position but i just know there are people who get confused in relation to people get confused in relation to the term fourfold if, if do you want to come prevent. in very yeah, there's briefly just, there's before just I go two to very members. brief points yeah. because the deputy who i have good regard for just raised a particular question and i would you know, if you do go for uh, to, to take a break you can read the text that's in this which sets out that, uh, you know, set out a carbon price trajectory that rises to 80 euros a tonne by 2030. And this should only be implemented when an evidence-based plan is in place to increase supports and incentives for climate action measures, including the protection of those vulnerable to fuel poverty. Now, you talked about the necessity for evidence. That's already catered for there. Just to add on to the point that you made, Chair, my calculations is that if you do the trajectory uh, over the period of time between now and 2030, it's 63 cents on a bag of coal, it's 13 cents on a bale of briquettes, and it's 1.5 cents on a litre of diesel. Now, for those of us that drive petrol or diesel cars will have noticed the fluctuation in fuel prices over the last number of months. It has gone from a low, I think, in the last six months of somewhere about 105 or 106 per litre to around 140 at the moment. The carbon component of that, if the trajectory that's being talked about here is, is, is set in place, will increase by 1.5 cents. Now, you know, we can all find ways to be against um, the issues that are, that are at the heart of this, or we can try to reach a consensus around setting in place an appropriate uh, response to what is the crisis that the young people uh, begged us, I would have thought anyway, begged us to address. They talked about taking leaps. Now, some here are suggesting that we should leap and try to resolve the problem on somebody else's shoulders. Large emitters of carbon and greenhouse gases will suffer most under this kind of progressive approach to pricing carbon. So the, 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 big, the, big, the big business that Deputy Smith continues to rail against, by the way, very significant employers, the agri-food sector, 
um, very significant employers, I might add, will have to pay more as a result of the difference. Please, oh, sorry, can, just, I, can I complete? Just let him can finish. I I they will have on. to pay more on the cost of their inputs, the cost of their inputs as a result of this, which will assist them in transitioning away from being heavy pollutants of carbon into the atmosphere. And the knock-on effect of that with respect, Deputy Smith, is that it will ensure that ExxonMobil and all the other exploration companies that you have rightly have identified as being problematic, there will be a move away from the products that they produce, the harmful products. So this is the method, if you want, by changing behaviour of achieving what you're seeking to do, which is put these companies out of business. Okay, I'm going to move. I have a number of people who had indicated earlier and they're waiting. Deputy Sherlock, you're next. No, it's just on yep. a technical point because the, uh, the, the wording is very clear. Uh, the wording is that the government should prior, and this is the key word, prior to the introduction of any increase in carbon taxation, examine the impacts on low-income families and, on the basis of these findings, introduce specific policy measures to assist those who may not be in a position to immediately transition from fossil fuels, including the potential use of social protection mechanisms such as tax credits and welfare payments. I think it's important for us to state that carbon tax is already in existence and that it yields approximately 400 million euros. But that 400 million euros goes into the National Exchequer. What this committee is seeking to do is to seek to ring fence monies that are collected by the carbon tax so that you can do the retrofitting and transitioning away from carbon from the 60 down to you know whatever target it is that we need to to meet but the key word here is that if we're if if we're agreeable to this amendment chair what is pertinent here is that the government should conduct a review to be completed by june 2019 uh, into the most appropriate measure and the extent and nature of fuel poverty across all cohorts. So we're building into the amendment a set of measures that seeks to protect the most vulnerable, but that you don't move until such time as you have uh, you've done your review. And but also, I, I and this is where I wanted to make the technical point. I feel that maybe June 2019 is probably uh, too soon or too short a time frame. Perhaps that needs to be pushed out to July. And if there's agreement on that, then I would be pushing for maybe July 2019. Yeah, we, but I think it's important that we do study what is in the amendment first and maybe have consideration to that before we draw any uh, conclusions. Thank you. I'll take note of that July um, detail. Uh, Senator Lombard. Thank you, Chair. Look, I think this motion, is, this motion is something that I support. I think it's a very balanced proposal. I think it brings a lot of clarity to the issue that we discussed over the last few months. We spent the last eight or nine months discussing this issue. This issue. We've had many people brought before us, but I do think when the Climate Change Action Advisory Council came before us and Professor Fitzgerald made his evidence known, the professional evidence of his body, which he's chairman of, it set out realistically where we need to go the carbon tax. It said quite clearly that the carbon tax needs to go to 80 euros a tonne by 2030. Or, yeah, 80 euros a tonne by 2030. So over the next 11 years, we're going to raise the carbon tax by 20, from 20 euros a tonne to 80 euros a tonne. And that was the professional advice that was given to us as a committee. We sat here, we listened to it, we questioned it, and we took it on board. I think there's very few of us who listened and engaged with that advice can now stand back and say it wasn't the professional advice given to us. We got no other advice saying it wasn't appropriate. So there's no point in us as members saying Sitting here for six, I if I didn't interrupt you, with respect, I didn't interrupt you. If I could finish, I didn't interrupt you. Senator, I didn't interrupt you. Senator, if you want to speak, Senator, which I let you in earlier, you indicate it. Please do not interrupt. Indicate, and I will let you in. I didn't interrupt the Senator. Please do not. Please do not start. We've we've been conducting ourselves very well to date, and I really don't want this to unravel on what is a small piece of our very important work. Thank you. If, if I could finish, Chair. Thank you. Contribution, Senator. I think this is an important issue. It's an important step for us. It's an important step for our society. We listen to our young people. We listen to what they wanted. And now we're trying to move forward. Nobody wants to put taxes on people. But this is about trying to get modal change and to get society to change so we can have a better society for all. And it's about bringing people with us. It's not about attacking the agricultural community or attacking the co-ops because we think they can pay for it. This is about bringing society with us. This is an important measure that we support. 
It's not something that we want to be championing a tax. We think it will do it best for our society and best for the actual environment itself. So this is what we're trying to do. And I've spent the last eight months listening to the evidence and taking it on board. When you have that kind of evidence brought before you, and when the Climate um, Change Advisory Council brought that evidence before us, and they've been critical of government policy, very critical of government policy, over the last few months and years. When that evidence is brought before us, you just have to take it on board, and you have to do the right thing for the Irish people and for the Irish society, and not just be playing to your electorate. Uh, Deputy Smith, you're next on my list, and I, I might, I, if, if members are, I don't know, agreeable, you can think about this. Deputy Smith did raise an issue about decoupling um, the issue around fuel uh, poverty, and maybe members, while Deputy Smith is making her contribution, that in some shape or form that could be, we could assist the Deputy in relation to that. Did you want to speak on this? On, very briefly? Uh, just to be helpful to, yeah. to read, I'm just wondering if, if that amendment then how would you proceed, could, Chair, I technically? Well, we, we could work that out. Maybe it's an extra yeah. recommendation, for example, a new recommendation. But I don't know. I'm in your hands in relation to this. Maybe, um, Deputy Smith. OK. Um, I, I want to come back on, on um, what Deputy Dooley yeah. said about the Sorry. ultimate yeah. uh, aim of this is to impact on the industries who are responsible for the most emissions. Yeah. And he makes a very interesting thesis that sounds very plaudible and very... Um, it would be great now if this could work and we get uh, the, the likes of Glanbia and Goodman and uh, ExxonMobil and all of the global corporations to have to pay more towards carbon uh, emissions. That would be ring-fenced to help poor people uh, change their behaviour. It's a great thesis you have there, but there's no empirical evidence for it anywhere in the world. And this is the problem I have. This committee allowed to be dropped into the middle of it, an ERSI stroke um, climate action report on why carbon tax must be increased to 80 euro. It's quoted in your, in your amendment and did not allow any counter evidence, didn't allow the time for the counter evidence and there's plenty of it. There is no evidence to back up your claim that this would be passed on to the global emissions of the dirtiest industries in the world. None evidence whatsoever. This is being passed on to ordinary people and that's it. End of story. That's why I say you can have any colour car you want as long as it's black. That's what's going on here and nothing else. Um, look, I do want my motion decoupled and I'll just go back to the original text that I put, in my, uh, in, I put it in in paragraph 4 in the original chapter on financing climate change. I requested that the Government commission a comprehensive inquiry into the extent and nature of fuel poverty across all cohorts of the population and the short, medium and long term impact of the increased carbon tax on all cohorts prior to, ta prior to taking a decision on carbon taxation. And I don't believe this motion goes anywhere near it because it's a play with words. I have to hats off to Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and everybody else. They're brilliant with the words. I, I hope I learn the skills someday to throw back at you. Because <laughs> you don't need any yeah, help there. Because I tell you, you what, don't need any help throwing back. I tell you back. what, what you're doing <laughs> here is, in the view, in view of the above, the, the yellowed paragraph that you have towards the end, the Minister for Finance should set out a carbon price trajectory that rises to 80 tonne per year, and this should only be implemented when an evidence-based plan is in place to increase support. Not the increased supports are in place, but the plan is in place. That's what the words say. Put the plan in place, then put on the carbon tax. It doesn't say when you put in the supports and the incentives. It's very smart. And I don't swallow it. And I, don't, I hope nobody in the gallery or out there swallows it either. It is, again, as I say, the one measure that this committee will be renowned for. Don't think of even touching the, the global corporations. Don't think about free public transport. For God's sake, you'd be nuts. Don't even think of increasing the amount of money we spend on public transport. Don't go near agribusiness or Larry Goodman or Glanbia, but by God, go after every man, woman and child in the country and put more tax on them. That's what you're doing. My final speaker, who has indicated, is Deputy Munster. If you could just keep it brief, and we try and uh, yes, yes. maybe adjourn if we need to mm. for ten minutes yes, to I try and come to yes, uh, Deputy I Munster. Yeah. Yes. Deputy Munster. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just in yes. relation yes. to what um, Deputy Dooley had said, and uh, Deputy Smith has just hidden it there. He made a point of um, pointing out that 
an evidence-based plan, but that's exactly what it is. As I said, there's absolutely nothing concrete in it, and they should know better than to, to um, depend that the gov or to rely on the government when they haven't done anything so far. This, when this committee was set up, I mean, they've had ample time to bring in measures to propose alternatives, ways of assisting people in order to drive that behave, behavioural change. They've, pro they've proposed no alternatives whatsoever. But just in relation to um, what, what your, your, your amendment says, literally just that when an evidence-based plan is in place to, incre to increase supports and incentive, incentives. So it's just a little cosy amendment and well worded in the sense that it's um, you know, it says everything and says nothing, but at the same time all it does is endorse the carbon tax um, uh, for the, all the very reasons that you opposed just 24 hours ago. But I would like to say just to the committee that um, this, this report overall is a very good report and we would be supportive of the majority of the recommendations in the report. And it's just for all the reasons I've outlined, for all of the reasons um, in order to drive behavioural changes, you have to provide alternatives. Um, we, can, we couldn't um, support the fact that the, the carbon tax, Chapter 6, but the majority of the chapters in that report, uh, we, would, we would fully be, support, be supportive of. So that's where, um, say, if uh, any of the... the been a fall, maybe people that, that wouldn't would have said yesterday anyway, I can't keep up with you, but yesterday you said that you wouldn't be in favour, pretty much argued the same case as we did, well then maybe they might like to um, support our amendment because all it'll do is just remove um, any, any references to carbon tax in the report and remove chapter 6. So then we have a fine report with all of the other chapters, all of the other recommend recommendations that the majority of us are in support of, and just leave out the, the carbon tax one until such time as we get an absolute solid, solid commitment, plan, time frame, scale and date from the government as to when they're going to offer these alternatives to drive that behavioural change. Deputy Stanley, then Senator Devine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well just, just in terms of timing, um, you know, it's very, very clear the amendment in that uh, the position now to allocate revenues uh, up to 2030 will be taken prior to budget 2020. That's the last line in the, uh, in the amendment. Uh, so I just want to note that. Um, I'm interested to hear the figures uh, being, being put out here, but figures put out by the Department of Finance um, on the 19th of December 2018, they said those figures, and it was reported on the National Broadcaster as well that day, they said that it would be 10.50 in carbon tax increase on a bag of fuel and 2.25 in a bed of briquettes. That doesn't. We asked a doll question about this this week and we got a reply. And that doesn't include the VAT content on top of that. So you're talking in the region of 12 euros on a bag of fuel and you're talking about 2.60 on a bed of briquettes. Just for so just Penny, that's at 100 euros a ton. So and it also doesn't. Your figures don't take into account that there's already 20. So if we're talking so, about the increase, it's okay. the gap. So just, yeah. so just, just no, just if, here. if if in, in, in for a factual check, yeah. I don't mind if it's brief but, and it's not disruptive. Thank you. So the facts are is is that this increase is substantial, um, on top of the, the already high fuel and energy, energy prices that we have. Um, the, this decision has been taken without, uh, without looking at uh, inter all international evidence or even a cross-section of it. It's simply been based on selected, selected pieces of information. And we've looked, at, we've looked at what's happened in other countries where they've had carbon tax and where they haven't had carbon tax. And here in this country we've had carbon tax since 2010. And apart from the recession, uh, from 2010 to 2015, when the country nearly closed down, uh, emissions did not go down during that period. Or emissions did not go down outside of that period. During that period, there was slight reduction. But we all know what's happened since. And before that time as well. I want to point out that. Um, 
The facts are is that it hasn't worked. And if you just take in, we put forward a document last year, Power in Ireland 2030, which was based on a year's research uh, uh, by people working for us, uh, by talking to experts, and by talking to anybody we could talk to in the industry, which set out, which set out a way of, of Power in Ireland, uh, the 32 countries of Ireland, uh, by 2030. And that would, have, that would have meant a switch, an 80% switch, but an 80% switch to renewable energy, to renewable energy. And you will note that in the, in the report, which is one of the things that we have fought hard for to get that in, that there's a 70%, we, that we switched to 70% renewable energy uh, by 2030. And that's good, that's in it. We, we, we obviously argued for the, for the 80%, and that's fair enough. So there's a lot of good stuff in the report. Uh, there's nine chapters in it, which you know, we are very happy with, with, with measures right across those nine chapters that are in it. Um, Unless we change the way we generate power, unless we do that, because more and more our heating systems are going to be electrified, so we're going to need more electricity, more and more transport is going to be electrified. Uh, but if we're, simply, if we're simply, simply thinking that we can drive around in, in nice little eco-friendly, what looks like eco-friendly uh, electric vehicles that are powered by fossil fuel, uh, power plants in England or nuclear power and a, a cable coming across the Irish Sea. And we're in favour of the interconnector, but what we need to be doing is generating power on this island, island from clean sources. And, you know, many expert groups have set out, set out a vision of how that can be done. And we've, we've tapped into that and we believe that the, our document here, the doc, committee document goes some way towards doing that and that's welcome. But the carbon tax, simply putting on a carbon tax to uh, on people uh, without shifting how we generate power, how we heat our homes, how we move about, uh, you know, without making it okay. easier to Thank cycle, you. without making it easier to use public transport, without having a good network of charging points, in, and that includes in rural Ireland, for people to use EVs, to use electric Thank vehicles, you. simply putting on this tax, all you're going to do is you're going to crucify middle-income and low-income households, and particularly small businesses. Senator Devine. Um, just as the seconder to Deputy Stanley's amendment, um, I wanted to obviously endorse it, but also to respond to Senator Lombard in a correct manner. Um, yes, we did have professionals, and we all listened, and we've spent, what, eight, nine months at this, and we've listened to them, um, who told us, some, some of them told us that carbon tax may, may prove useful. Uh, we also did our own research, which I think the jury is still out on it. But regardless of that, those professionals gave a very science, well, in their own uh, area of expertise, their own scientific opinion on it. What wasn't taken into account at all were the ordinary families, the ordinary people that this tax will have the most burden, the burden on. And these, you accused me of kind of playing to the electorate. I'm not. I'm representing the electorate. That's what I'm doing here. I don't play to the electorate, Senator Lombard. I play. To, I represent the people who are terrified of where the next washing machine is going to come from because they don't okay. have we'll just let the, the cash for continue that. Continue and continue her contribution. I, I missed that. I was probably better off missing that too. And I just want to make an. Deputy, Deputy Dooley, just let, her, let Sorry, yeah. Senator finish. Do it in the appropriate manner, please, Deputy Dooley. And I just want to, I suppose, appeal to, to the young people who we've had in here um, on several occasions and have been absolutely uh, triumphant in trying to get across the message of how urgent uh, our climate and our planet and how on the edge we might be, and I, I, I know they understand, they understand social justice, they understand the demand for social justice because they have led it, they have led it in changing this country, and they will understand the fuel poverty facing an awful lot of families in this country that they talked about when they made the presentation on the 6th of March in the AV room. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Dooley. Yeah, thanks very much. Just maybe to bring a conclusion, because there still seems to be some confusion about what the intention uh, of the amendments that, that, that we have brought. 
accepting the necessity for a price trajectory in carbon pricing from, 80, from 20 euros to 80 euros by 2030. And this, because this is where we need a bit of clarity. And this should only be implemented when an evidence-based plan is in place. Now, to me, in place means that it's there and it's available to increase supports and incentives for climate action measures, including the protection of those vulnerable to fuel poverty. And it goes on. So if there's any doubt whatsoever about your understanding of the term in place, or if you need further qualification, it's in the second paragraph. The government should, prior to the introduction of any increases in carbon taxation, examine the impacts, etc., introduce specific policy measures to assist those who may not be in a position to immediately transition from fossil fuels, including those uh, including the potential use of social protection mechanisms such as tax credits and welfare payments. So now, it, it's worth remembering that we're a committee of the House. This is not the Cabinet room. We collectively, having heard the evidence, are making suggestions, recommendations, etc., to government, to this government, to future governments. It's not for us to take a decision that sets the budget, we don't, we, we're, we're, we're not deciding the budget today. We're not deciding specific policy. Yes, we will have opportunities to do that at other stages, as we're all fortunate to be elected members of, of these houses. So this is an effort on a cross-party basis to put forward recommendations to government. Now, we were very strongly of the view that this needed to be sequenced in terms of our suggestions. And the strong recommendation that the party that I represent was very adamant that you wouldn't progress with an increase in carbon charging until such time as you had made recommendations and had a plan in place and had these incentives in place. And that's very clear in the language. Now, I don't know how we can be more helpful because I do accept uh, that Deputy Stanley Deputy Munster uh, and Senator Devine have engaged fully um, and, and proactively in the campaign, and I think we largely agree on all aspects of it. But it may not be a surprise, and I'm not surprised that you have an issue, because you've, you've flagged it on a few occasions, about the idea of any increases uh, in, in, in carbon pricing. That, 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 that's a fact, so there's no issue for me there. But clearly, Let's not try to indicate that any of us have greater care than the other for the people on lower incomes. I think we're all mindful of that, and we're trying to ensure that as we transition away from fossil fuels, we protect the people who are most vulnerable to fuel poverty. And that's inherent in this recommendation. Can we absolutely direct government to do it from here? No because we're not sitting around the cabinet table. But we do have an opportunity from this collective to set, to set that forward. Um, and that's why I, I, you know, I'd be very clear that if the government follow the advice of this committee and follow the, the really expressed position, they will have in place, or they would be expected to have in place if they're to be true to this report, have to have in place appropriate measures to protect those people who are, rightly as you identified, who are not in a position to change that car that's 10 years or over, not in a position to do the deep retrofit in their home, not in a position to pay the additional uh, 63 cent uh, on a bag of coal that it would uh, impact on them on, on, on a yearly basis. So that's very clear. And then, hardwired in here again from the report, uh, is that the monies that would be collected are ring-fenced with a legislative provision so that those monies can go back to assist people in making that behavioural change. And I feel that the, the wording is here is very clear. What I think we would all be concerned is either this or any future government might seek to cherry-pick elements of the report. Ah, oh, the, the report recommended an increase in tax. Let's grab the tax and put it into the bottom line and use it to backfill uh, you know, a, a hole in the exchequer. This report is saying you shouldn't do that. It's saying you've got to identify the appropriate supports and mechanisms to assist the people who will be impacted most negatively by an increase in, in carbon taxes. And you need to have those plans in place. You need to have those schemes in place and available. 
before you start to charge or increase the charge that already exists. And that, to me, is why um, the party that I represent, Fianna Fáil, are, are, are happy to proceed with it. We didn't have any change of heart. We were always very clear, both within these walls and publicly, that we supported carbon pricing as, as, as a part of the climate change agenda. Not the be-all, not the end-all, but a component in shifting behaviour. And the carbon pricing that's set out here is not limited to individuals. It impacts on businesses as well. And I have to reiterate the point to my, to my good friend, Deputy uh, Breed Smith, that it, it is about assisting uh, and encouraging, particularly the bigger companies, because they're the ones that are going, who, who use the most amount of fossil fuels, who contribute most to, to greenhouse gas emissions. It's in their financial interest to, to, to migrate away from fossil fuels to cleaner energies. And, and this is a progressive way of assisting them in doing that. Um, there is a wider debate where you and I would differ very significantly um, about you know, the role of big business in an economy, etc. But that's for, you know, the ideological debates are for elsewhere. This is about um, responding to the crisis that's in uh, our, our, the climate chaos that's there, the crisis that we face in addressing it within the next 12 to 13 years. This is a contribution. Um, and we've got to be careful and mindful in, in, in introducing measures that we don't leave people behind and that we don't make you know, their lives even more difficult and more, more intolerable. And I do need to go back to the numbers because they were raised. My calculations, based on a bag of coal in today's money at €17, Euros, would see an increase of €0.63 cent year on year, but it's 63 cent a year. If you throw VAT in, that's another 7 cent, so 70 cent a year. A bale of briquettes, 450, if that's, if that's what they are, that's a 13 cent increase in that. If you want to put the VAT on that one, it's about a cent. The diesel, which is the greatest concern that, that Deputy Munster had, and, and, and I share that, coming from a rural constituency and representing people in rural Ireland, both in the agriculture sector uh, and, and in those that have to commute uh, on a daily basis. As I've rightly identified, the fluctuation in diesel prices has been in the region of 30 to 35 cents in the last six months. What the introduction uh, or the increase in carbon on a trajectory on a year-per-year -year basis would see an increase of about 1.5 cent. Now, that, that, would be, that, would be, that would be washed, in, washed into it. But that's, that's, that's the reality. Now, what, you know, the important thing is, and this is where I like the idea of a trajectory, it sets out certainty. It says to people who are planning for the future, it says to the automotive industry that diesel and petrol are getting more expensive and that hopefully they will take action in meeting the demands uh, of society. But there will be a requirement for the state to provide additional revenues from exchequer resources to assist in the massive effort that has to be made to do the, the deep retrofit of homes. And there will have to be, in my view, resources brought from with the broader exchequer, not just from the carbon fund that will assist. Thank assisting. you, Deputy. Are you agreeable to adjourn for 10 minutes? Yes, please. Thank you. The 22, is that okay? Or? 10, 10, 10. 10, 10, 10. 10 to, is it? you want to come back? No, at, no, sorry, no, 10 no. minutes, you mean? 10 yeah. minutes. So 10 22, minutes. yeah, 22, 22. 20 to 5. Mm. Uh, that's 10 minutes, isn't it? 10 minutes. Oh, do you want 20 minutes? 16. No, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, that's fine. I know we're all eager to get this completed. Okay, so 20 to 5. If no one... Three votes right away. So we're going to have right three votes, I think, straight away. So again, we'll rather than waiting for the bells every time, we might just ring the bells first. But just just in the or the sequence of the voting. Um, so the first 
The first amendment is the Sinn Féin amendment. Um, yeah. yeah. First, I'll just go through the sequence before we go back and talk. Uh, so the first amendment, sorry, the first vote is on the Sinn Féin amendment to the amend yeah, to, to the, the to, to the, the, the to, 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 to delete the amendment. So that's that we propose that all references to carbon tax increase be deleted from the document, and that a single recommendation be made to Chapter Six that no increase in tar carbon tax be made. Then after that, we will go to the Green Party amendment. Okay. I'm going to draw that one. It, it, okay. there, um, there's actually clear agreement in the, at the end of the document, just reflecting on it, but all our, this work, this proposal we're taking is going to be concluded prior to Budget 2020. There's common agreement, except for those who would disagree fundamentally with the approach, but there is common agreement on that timeline that we have to get this into the Budget in 2020, uh, and I think while we're not the Cabinet, we can build that, or we have built a certain consensus among those parties who agree, which will help make this not the, the key burning divide, divisive issue. So actually, with that wording at the end of that, of that line, I, I just refle on reflection and this is the argument, I'm happy to pull my amendment, and the sake of time as well, Chairman. Thank you. So then, so just to go, so the Sinn Féin amendment to delete all reference to carbon tax. So then, the next one then, Deputy Smith, did you want to decouple? Yes. Yeah, so your, my understanding of what you're asking for is in that cross-party amendment, yes. is that correct, that the government should, prior to the introduction of any increase in carbon tax, exam, you want to take this out, examine the impacts on low-income families and, on the basis of these findings, introduce specific policy measures to assist those who may not be in a position to immediately transition from fossil fuels, including the potential use of social protection me mechanisms such as tax credits and welfare payments. You want to, to take that out and you want a separate um, recommendation. Am I correct? Yes. I want you to reinsert my amendment, which was removed from the original text. You want to reinsert it into the report separately? Into the report separately. You don't separately. want it in this cross-party? No, I, I yeah. don't. I That's think it's just unfair that, to me, yeah. and I think yeah. that it should be a separate okay, motion fine, fine, that fine. ends by saying that uh, this yeah. will, ca prior to any decision being yes. taken on the, cor on, the cor on the carbon tax, we'll say corporation tax, I'm obsessed with the corporations. Um, prior to any decision being taken to increase carbon tax. Yes, it's there. Yeah, it's, uh, also, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, prior to. Yeah, that, 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 uh, oh, yeah. So it's, it's number 28 there on this document that you want to have that as a standalone recommendation. Isn't that correct, Deputy Smith? Yeah, I, I, that, I just want to clarify for others. Just that, that's why I'm, I'm not asking you. the document you're talking about, just so I can. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's 28. It's on the, okay. it's on the screen. So, it's number 28 on the yeah, screen. We have a search. And then after that, we will go to the cross-party amendment, if that's, if that's the sequence. We have to see how the vote so, goes. Sorry. Okay? Um, sorry, I, just, I do need to qualify this, because what I'm looking at is my original um, request, which was taken out by the advisers, not by vote of this committee. And it finished, the sentence finished, not with including the review of the short, medium and long-term impact of increasing the carbon tax, but it finished. That's included, but then um, that that would be taken into consideration on all cohorts prior to taking a decision to increase the carbon tax. And that's an important last five words prior to taking. No, sorry, At that's eight words. Put that in note that sorry, Sherlock. Chair, just on a technical point, if 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 Deputy Smith's amendment is as she has put forward to the committee. That, that is your own amendment that you've put forward, if that makes sense. Are you now, is, is Breed now amending her own amendment that she has put forward? No, I never amended it. Somebody else amended it. My original amendment was that it be done prior to any decision being taken to increase carbon tax. But we it's already that, there. That text is there. The government should, prior to the introduction of any increase in carbon taxation, examine the impacts on low-income families and on the basis of these findings, introduce specific policy measures to assist those who may not be in a position to immediately transition from fossil fuels, including the potential use of social protection mechanisms such as tax credits and welfare payments. Deputy Smith wants that as a standalone recommendation. Don't speak for you, Deputy Smith, but I think that's what she is saying. She wants it as a standalone recommendation. Would I be correct in that, Deputy you Smith? You are correct in yeah. that. So can I, can that's, I, that's the nuance here. Yeah. Um, so that, was, that would be another vote, okay? Yeah, just through the chair, if yes, I could respond to that. Yeah. It's all part of a recommendation 
It's the, it's the, it's the qualification within a recommendation that if you, if you go down the carbon tax route as a government, then we're suggesting that the only way you should do that is to have this documented. So to me, and I don't profess to be an English scholar, it, it makes absolute sense that it would remain as it is. And I propose that you know we're, we're only talking about positioning of yeah. text here. Yeah. The spirit of it is there, and, and I'd suggest we leave it as it is. Okay, Deputy Sherlock. To be helpful, my understanding from Deputy Smith's earlier intervention was that she wanted it as a standalone. And, and, and that will be presumably pressed as a standalone. The issue now before us is whether or not the amendment, the standalone amendment that Deputy Smith has put forward, uh, that the text of that that she has put forward uh, seems now to have changed, that there is additional wording that needs to be brought forward by Deputy okay. Smith to reflect yeah. the amendment that she seeks to have as a standalone. If the members are agreeable to change that, we can do that. I, uh, can I just reiterate really my too. point, right? I think you made your point clearly, and it's just yeah. a procedure thing. So I Deputy Sherlock was, was just saying that we're changing the wording here yeah. to your amendment, and, and I suppose normally you could say you can't do that, but if the members are agreeable, we can do that and, and have your, your recommendation stand alone and put that to a vote. So I, I'm clear on what you want to do, Deputy Smith. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as you, you want to change the wording in recommendation 28. It's, it's not as you want to put in prior to taking a decision on a carbon tax. Yeah. You want to change the wording to yes. that. We have to define what that is so that the members know what they're voting on. And rather than have it part of that cross-party um, cross recommendation, which includes a carbon tax, your, your concern is that it's, it's, it's in the same recommendation yeah. recommending a carbon tax. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's on the screen now. It's on the screen now. It's on the screen now with the change made. So, Chair, Sorry, I know, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I got <laughs> Deputy, Deputy Sherlock. So, the proposal of the amendment, um, well, I don't want to say anything in her absence, but yeah, except to say that I have no problem personally with her putting forward her amendment as she is amending it herself. If that makes sense, because that's what you're asking us to do. Okay. Well, if yeah. the members. So we're working on that wording, rewording of her amendment. And that's where Indeed. Deputy Smith is gone, I think, at the moment, to get a, a new wording of her own amendment. We have put it on the screen. And we've put it on the screen, but the rewording is not there. It is. Oh, it is. Sorry, is it? Oh, sorry. You listened and you, you wished through. So. Prior to the taking decision so, on the carbon tax is what you want to say. Yeah. Therefore. Prior to taking a decision on carbon tax. I think, Deputy Smith, is this okay what's on the screen? Is this what you have requested to be changed to? So medium and long term impact of increasing the carbon tax. See it there, Deputy yes, Smith I highlighted do, yeah. prior to taking a decision on, on carbon tax. Is that? Just let me check because what I'm looking at is a document that has been altered and altered many to eight yes, times. Yes, we, we're trying to rectify that now, so if you can try yeah. and help so us so with it to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a comment. We have a comment. We have a comment. Yes. That's, okay, That's agreed. fine. Okay, so we'll start with the Sinn Féin amendment. We're going to call our vote on the Sinn Féin amendment. So, sorry now. So the question is... Yeah, one second, I have to find with all my notes here. Here it is. The question is that we propose that all references to carbon tax increase be deleted from the document and that a single recommendation be made in to Chapter 6 that no increases in carbon tax be made. All those in favour say thaw. All those against say Neil. Neil. I think the question is lost. Vote thaw. Okay. The bells will ring for eight minutes and we'll take then the next votes one after the other. So yours is next.
um, the doors will now be locked and a division shall be taken. So just to remind members and what you're voting on, that we propose that all references to carbon tax increase be deleted from the document and that a single recommendation be made to Chapter 6 that no increases in carbon tax be made. So on that question, a division has been called. Pursuant to standing orders, the division will now be taken by the clerk to the committee. Okay. Deputy Mary Butler. Yeah. Deputy Jack Chambers. Yeah. Deputy Marcella Cochran Kennedy. Yeah. Deputy Colin Brophy. Yeah. Deputy Timmy Dooley. Yeah. Deputy Martin Hayden. Yeah. Um, Deputy Imelda Mulster. Oh. Deputy Breed Smith. Oh. Deputy Hildegard Nocton. Yeah. Deputy Tom Neville. Deputy Captain Nolan in here. Deputy Thomas Pringle. Oh. Deputy Eamon Ryan. Yeah. Deputy Sean Sherlock. Yeah. Deputy Brian Stanley. Oh. Okay, and then uh, the Senator, Senator Paul Daly. Yeah. Senator Maura Devine. Oh. Tim Lombard. Yeah. Senator Ian Marshall. Yeah. Uh, Senator Michelle Mulhern. Yeah. And Senator Grace O'Sullivan. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's one, two, three, four, five, 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 tall, three, four, seven, two, nine, two, seven, two, thirteen, two, fifteen, fifteen. The question is lost. Okay. 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 So, tall five, Neil, fifteen, the question is lost. We'll now move to Deputy uh, Breed Smith's amendment, and that is. Um, I, we read it out there earlier. It's on your screen, actually, there. It's yeah. to, amend, to amend. To amend. The amendment. The amendment by, by, by the, deleting the, the paragraph of fuel yeah, poverty. By deleting the fuel poverty section in that amendment. Okay. So again, okay. We're back to M Mary Butler. Neil. Jack Chambers. Neil. Marcella Cochran Kennedy. Neil. Colin Brophy. Neil. Timmy Dooley. Neil. Martin Hayden. Neil. John Hart. Imelda Munster. Breed Smith, oh. Hildegard Nocton, Tom Neville, Colonel Thomas Pringle, oh. Eamon Ryan, Neil. Sean Sherlock, Neil. Brian Stanley, oh. and then uh, Paul Daly, Neil. Maura Devine, oh, uh, Tim Lombard, Neil. Ian Marshall, Neil. and Michelle Mulhern, Neil. and Grace O'Sullivan. So that's one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, fifteen. 15. So one, two, three, four, five, yeah, okay, yeah. So Thaw five, five uh, Neil fifteen, the question is lost. We'll now move to the cross party um, amendment. And I'll call on the clerk yeah. again. The question is that the amendment, the cross-party amendment, be made. Um, and as a division has been challenged pursuant to standing orders, the division will now be taken by the clerk to the committee. Oh, Deputy Butler. Oh. Deputy Chambers. Oh. Deputy Cochrane Kennedy. Oh. Deputy Brophy. Oh. Deputy Julie. Oh. Deputy Hayden. Oh. Deputy Munster. Oh. Deputy Smith. Oh. Deputy Nocton. Oh. Deputy Neville, Deputy Thomas Pringle, Deputy Eamon Ryan, Deputy Sherlock, Deputy Stanley, okay, and then Senator Daly, Senator Devine, Senator Lombard, Senator Marshall, Senator Mulhern, and Senator O'Sullivan. Okay, so that's two, one, two, three, four. Paul 15, Neil 5, the question is carried. Now we have one other amendment uh, here. It's amendment on this. Yes. I, I made a point about June 2019. We voted on the amendment. Do, do I take it that that was changed to July or? Yeah. 
or not? Is that an issue for members? It's agreed. Okay, it's agreed. Okay, it's agreed. It's agreed. It might never happen. Could he, Stanley? Yeah. Next amendment is on this chapter. Yes, yes, it is. We're staying That's on this okay, chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so yeah. this is amendment number two. No, no, it's this, this is this is this is our last yeah. chapter. Uh, um, amendment number twenty-nine. Yeah. Isn't it? In the name of. Uh, sorry, maybe AP. it's a different number on your. Hang on, sorry, let me see now. No, amendment 29, page 49. Sorry, page 49. Sorry, Amendment yeah. 29. Amend page amendment 29, and we have this already discussed. The committee recommends that the Department of Finance, this is Deputy Smith, uh, that the Department of Finance commission an inquiry into the revenue that could be realised through the introduction of a carbon tax on the profits of corporations and firms directly linked to the production and sale of gas, oil, coal, and other fossil fuels. That inquiry should also look at the revenue that could be realised from the imposition of a carbon tax on the profits of other corporations and firms linked to high usage of fossil fuels, including aviation, shipping, etc. So we have discussed this earlier, and uh, Deputy Smith made... Well, to my view, we haven't analysed this want... enough at all in this committee, and I'll just put that on the record. Okay. The idea that we have spent days, if not weeks, agonising about a carbon tax on uh, the population and tiny amount of time really analysing what could be done here. This could be the leap forward. This could be the magnanimous step that we need to take in order to realise what's going on according to the IPCC, according to the United Nations, according to the International Energy Agency. We have hardly looked at it. Okay, yeah, very briefly, because I'm just conscious of time and people yeah, have commitments to, to get no, to... No, no, just to support it, as I said, I think in my discussion last night, we introduced such a tax in our time in government, unfortunately, with regard to the Supreme Court, but I think we should go back and look at that experience, because it, it was very, it was a technicality, as I recover in the court, so I would agree, I think such a report would be very useful, uh, such an inquiry would be very useful, and if that mechanism is not possible, then look at some other. So, just support it. And, yeah, we have a vote. Okay. Um, just before we would call a vote on this, there is after this, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but just to try and conclude our, our work here because we're nearly done. After this, there are two textual, um, an amendment one and amendment 15 in relation to the text of, in the chapters. After that, if we could, if there are, if there are votes to be called, that will be called with this amendment and also those two textual amendments at the one time so that we're not calling eight minute votes every time. Would that be agreed? So if we want to, we won't have time to, we have to go for our vote in the doll here and adjourn, come back after the vote and we'll go straight into these votes and finalise the report. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. So the question is that the new priority amendment number 29 under the name of Deputy Breach Smith be agreed. Those in favour? Sorry, Sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm tired the same as everybody else is and I really appreciate the work that you've done, Chair. You've been extraordinarily patient and decent and flexible and everything else. But I think I'd like a bit of debate on this. If not debate, I'd like to hear what those who oppose a tax on carbon, uh, the profits of the carbon industry and the fossil fuel industry have to say, because they've never heard what they had to say. I know they're going to vote against it, but somebody here should speak up against yep. it. There was, okay, I have no problem if somebody wants to come in on it, but there was a discussion on this yesterday in relation to taxing of profits. So if members... The profits of the agri-industry, and I understand the sensitivity around agriculture for a lot of the deputies in here. But this is about fossil fuel production, which is a, a very much a global and goes to the heart of the global uh, problem. 
and the whole notion of keeping it in the ground and stop burning carbon. This is really goes to the heart of it. And I, I'm kind of I've made the arguments as best I can for the movement from my perspective as often as I can. I can do it again, but I really would like to, uh, with due respect to the whole nature of this discussion and this discourse, I'd like to hear the arguments against this. Deputy Sheriff, did you want to come in? Yeah. Well, but, but who's to say that we're going to vote against the amendment? <laughs> Chair, do you know what I mean? I would say put the amendment and let that and, be. And clear. then have the argument. I mean, you've, you've put your amendment. Yeah. Uh, it's six o'clock. It's Thursday. You know. I know that members have do have commitments on this, and the standing committee, as I say, will continue. We have to agree the terms of reference of that as well in private session afterwards. But I would like to try and, yeah, in private session, be very short. But we just have a number of short votes here. We will then conclude and publish the report. But that could be done within the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if people are agreeable. So I'm going to put the question. Uh, sorry, um, can I respectfully ask anybody who is opposed to this amendment to speak and tell me why they're opposed to it? Now, if they're not opposed to it, then that's great. We'll have passed it. No bother. A large majority. OK, so th this question is on the new priority. Rec it's Amendment 28. It's amendment 28. Sorry, it's Amendment 29. Excuse 29. me. Yeah. Amendment 29 is a new priority recommendation under the name of Deputy Breed Smith. Is it? Oh, it's on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to, if no members are, are contributing, I am going to put this to a vote. So the question is, does the new primar priority recommendation 29 be made? Those in favour say thaw. Thaw. Those against say nil. Okay. I think the question is lost. Vote thaw. Okay. We're going to call a bell for eight minutes. We're going to take all the votes together. The next, the next two, as agreed before we had our vote in the vote. Okay.
Second, on the question, yeah. that the question is that Amendment 29, the new recommendation be made and a division has been challenged. Pursuant to standing orders, a division will now be taken by the clerk to the committee. Okay. Deputy Butler. Tall. Deputy Chambers. Tall. Deputy Corcoran Kennedy. Neil. Deputy Brophy. Neil. Deputy Dooley. Hayden. Here. Deputy John Lehart. Okay. Deputy Melda Munster. Deputy Breed Smith. Deputy Hildegard Nocton. Neil. Deputy Tom Neville. Neil. Deputy Karen Owen. Neil. Tom, Thomas Pringle. Oh. Eamon Ryan. Oh. Sean Sherlock. Oh. Fran Stanley. Oh. Okay. Paul Daly. Oh. Maura Devine. Tim Lombard. Neil. Ian Marshall. Neil. Michelle Mulhern. Neil. And Grace O'Sullivan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There you go. <laughs> I think she has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I want to carry them. Let's go on. So, Taw is 12, Neil is 8, the question is carried. So now we move to. 12 8. 12 8. Again, We're all right, we're all right. Okay, um, next is the chapter 6. As amended. Is that agreed? Not agreed. Um, vote all. So we don't need to, to ring the bells, we're all here. So yeah. we're going to go through the process again. The clerk, um, pursuant to standing, sorry, is that okay? Pursuant to standing orders, the division will now be taken by the... ...is now agreed. Those in favour say thaw, say thaw, those against say nil. So now we're going through it here. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mary Butler. Oh. Okay. Deputy Jack Chambers. Oh. Marcella Corcoran Kennedy, uh, Col Colum Brophy, uh, Deputy Dooley, Deputy Hayden, Deputy Lehart, Deputy Munster, Deputy Breed, Deputy Hildegard Nocton, Deputy Tom Neville, <coughs> Tom Thomas Pringle, Deputy Eamon Ryan, Deputy Sean Sherlock. Brian Stanley. Neil. Uh, Senator Daly. No. Senator Devine. Neil. Senator Lombard. No. Senator Marshall. No. Senator Mulhern. No. And Senator Grace O'Sullivan. No. Okay, that's fine. So that's carried. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sixteen, four, and two, two three, four. Four, four against. So carry. Sixteen four. Sixteen four. Four Neil. So the question has been carried. So now we will move to the minor text changes. That's the next part. Yeah. So we have two here: Amendment Number One and Amendment Number. Fifteen. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Yeah. One and fifteen. I don't know if I want to take them together. The first one is to delete the word "poor" and replace with "appalling." And the second amendment for fifteen is in chapter. Sorry, that was in chapter one. So that's from page six, from line one hundred sixty-six. Delete the word "poor" and replace with "appalling." And the second amendment, amendment fifteen. That's Deputy Breed Smith. Both of them are sorry. And it is from page thirty-nine, from line one three six seven. New text after she wants to insert uh, shall, shall arise from continued climate change. After that, insert. Meanwhile, corporations are being allowed to accrue vast profits from the production and extraction of fossil fuels without reference to the long-term costs being imposed on society. And again, if the uh, deputy Smith. Yeah, just a quick word on, on both of them. On the, on the, the, the removal of the word "poor" to replace with the word "appalling." It's significant because it's in chapter one and it's looking at the sort of preamble to the whole context in which we're having this 
long debate and scrutiny of what's going on with the climate and how we adjust it. And I think to be honest with people, to be really honest, and particularly to show leadership to young people, we have to say that we are not, but we're not only just, you know, not good, poor, at, uh, at dealing with our carbon emissions. We're awful, we're terrible. And I think the word appalling is appropriate there. On the other amendment, much more appropriate now that we have secured a vote for the, uh, the amendment on uh, the, looking at an uh, investigation into the taxing the profits of the fossil fuel industry. Very appropriate that I should go into the text now, considering the change that I wouldn't have predicted anyway in light of Fianna Fáil supporting that motion. Let it go with the first one. There you are. No. Okay. <laughs> so, and, any, anybody else want to contribute? Deputy Dooley. comment here is, like, there's a recognition that we're trying to move away from fossil fuels, um, but there's also a recognition that part of that transition is we need fossil fuels. So there's, I'm just a bit concerned that there's this over demonization. I know where we need to get it. I know how I think we should get there. But I don't think this language adds anything. No, we're appealing to the kids. We're not actually. Are you talking about poor or are you talking about? I'm just about talking about both actually. But, but I mean, in poor and appalling, I mean, I, 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 I care less which, which it is. We're sending a signal to who or what. It's actually a report that's going to government from members of the Iraqis who are seeking to have stuff done, which is why maybe the report has been allowed to get too broad and wide. Um, so I don't, ha I don't ha have a view one way or another. I just think we should try and wrap this up. Yeah. I, don't think there's I don't think it adds anything. And shall I continue to insert, OK, meanwhile, corporations are being allowed to accrue as if there's some conspiracy going on out there. So Deputy Smith might believe it's there is. It's not conspiracy. It's the system. Okay. Right. So, so, so we're getting into the ideology of the economic systems which we reside in, and for that, I'm content the system that's there and we need to fix it and change it. So, you know, creating these bogey people over here in the big oil companies, you know, to me isn't necessarily the way to go. We need to show the pathway to change. And I'm more interested in looking how we get from where we're at to where we need to be rather than getting language. You know, if, if Deputy Smith had come and was prepared to accept some of the other measures, maybe, but... I accepted lots of measures. To me, that's not fair. Okay. I accepted so, so many measures, it's unbelievable. Okay. But a lot of the stuff I wanted in was changed in the context of the advisors meeting each other and saying, get that out, put that in, get that out, put okay. that in. We're going to so keep I'm going back here. To it now we, and we I'm have asking to, for context. Okay. Uh, Deputy Hayden has indicated. Sure. I just, I, I just yes. want to. I, I don't want anybody mischaracterising the role of the advisors here in this process. And I just want to be very clear here that the advisors have played a, an extremely beneficial role. And I, I personally, had it not been for my own advisor, uh, Anya Murray, I, I think I would have been at a serious loss in re relation to the work that this committee has done. Mm, and I, I just want to say that for the record. I, I do not want there to be any impression put out here that the advisors were, were anything less than courteous, professional, and, and that they sought to work together even when there were significant differences of opinion in respect of uh, policy issues. So I just want to put that on the record here. Can I fully accept that? Okay, I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in, there's a number of speakers on this. There's a number of speakers on this. Deputy Hayden. Yeah, I would like to concur with uh, Deputy Sherlock there. In particular, look, this is first, with the exception of yesterday, it's the first time we've been in public session since January. Uh, and what the public wouldn't be aware of is the level of detail and work that every member of this committee has gone through um, hugely assisted by our advisors uh, because it's so technical, because of the range of different issues. Uh, and I too want to just put on the record our appreciation to all of the advisors and how they, just as we have done, have worked um, across party divides um, in as far as we can to, to try and come to consensus. You know, the, the point that Deputy Smith is trying to make here uh, that I see when she's done with large corporations, it just feeds into the narrative. If, for those who are opposed to um, any carbon, increase in carbon pricing or carbon pricing at all, they need a bogeyman. They need to say this narrative that ordinary people is a phrase I've heard so many times that jars me every time it's said as if I don't represent ordinary people, as if every member of this uh, committee doesn't represent ordinary people, and that some people have a monopoly on caring for the poor and the, the vulnerable and the weak. That's why we're all in politics here, is to help people. We might have a different approach to how we do that. 
but to, to have the view that you have no, uh, there's no need for carbon pricing uh, to pay for the things that we need to do, you need to say there's rich people somewhere, there's this pot of money somewhere that ordinary people then don't have to make any contribution along the way. Um, and you know, that's a narrative that just um, isn't true, and it's, it's okay. the fact of it. Deputy Marcella Corkin Kennedy. Oh, sorry, I thought you indicated. Sorry, yeah. Senator Lombard. Yeah, look, Chair, I just want to make two points if I could. One about the actual process that we've gone through and the advisors and the input of, uh, the advisors have had. This has been a unique process that has involved them at the very early stage. I think we've all learned so much from the advisors, and I think any hammering of the advisors is unfortunate at this stage. I think going forward, it's a process that other committees should look at and how we actually got professional input at a very technical level so we can make these decisions. Regarding this issue itself, I think, you know, this is about, in many ways, we're trying to um, ensure we fair play across the board. I don't think this amendment has any standing of any nature. Uh, Deputy Smith. Okay, I, I want to publicly apologise to the impression given to the advisers that I somehow disrespect them. I don't at all. Um, my intent there was to show that the advisers are there to, to reflect what those who they are advising want in the report, and I don't think any of them would disagree with that. They have to reflect what the parties that they are working on behalf of want in the report as my advisor has attempted to do for me, which is why the reference was to put this in, get that out, was a political decision by those they represent to minimise the uh, language that would make, for, for starters in the First Amendment, make Ireland not look so bad when it comes to climate change. Our record is appalling. If we want to use the word poor, then fair enough, but at least what's happened here is that in, with Martin Hayden, or Deputy Martin Hayden's contribution, I have had an answer to why there's opposition to the question of, uh, of putting a tax on the profits of the fossil fuels. An answer I tried to get earlier on, but I got it now, and I'm very grateful to get that answer. But on the record, to the advisers and all the work they've done, I have no disrespect whatsoever. I do disrespect the political views of, 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 of the people, some of the people around the table, but that's life, and that's why I'm here. Are you pressing the two amendments, Deputy? I'm pressing the two amendments. Okay, and do, you want, do the members want to take the two of them together or separately? Yes. Yeah. So take the two together. Okay, so we don't need to ring the bell, so we're all here. We're all here. So, uh, so the two amendments are being pressed? Yeah. So all, are, all those, those in favour say tho? Yeah. Oh. Those against say Neil? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to call a vote here. Okay. The clerk is going to call out the names. Okay, uh, Deputy Butler? Neil. Deputy Chambers? Neil. Deputy Corcoran Kennedy? Neil. Uh, Deputy Brophy? Neil. Deputy Dooley? Neil. Deputy Hayden? Neil. Uh, Deputy Hart? Deputy Munster? No. Deputy Breed Smith? No. Deputy Nocton? Neil. Deputy Neville? Neil. Deputy Pringle? No. Deputy Ryan. No. Deputy Sherlock. No. Deputy Stanley. No. Senator Daly. No. Oh, Neil, Neil. Sorry, Neil. Senator Devine. Senator Lombard. Senator Marshall. <coughs> Senator Mulhern yes. and Senator O'Sullivan. Oh. Okay, that's correct. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, top ten. Top ten. Mm -hmm. Lost. So, Thaw, 7, Neil, 13, the question is lost. Okay. So now, we have one, if you do want to vote on it, or maybe we don't, it's one final uh, question, that the report be the report of the committee and that it be laid before both houses. Just, just make one quick comment. Very brief. You know, very briefly, just the, the, um, the overall report has some very good content in it, very good proposals. Yeah, in we've it. said, I really and, don't want everyone to come back just, in again. I think you've had an no, opportunity. I just want to finish the sentence. Within 10 seconds. Just, yeah, and um, what I would say is, is that we will be voting against the report because of Chapter okay. 6 and the inclusion of carbon tax. Oh, thank you for that. And we will be launching an, uh, an alternative minority report.
proceed. I'm going to proceed now here with proceed because we are working on this current report for before us that we've worked on for the last seven months. So the question is that the report be the report of the committee and that it be laid before both houses. Is that agreed? Agreed. Not agreed. Not, not agreed. Four times. We're going to have a, no, that we're going to not wait eight minutes because we've already agreed that all the all the members of state were all here. So a division has been challenged uh, pursuant to standing orders. The division will now be taken by the clerk to the committee. So that question is that the report be the report of the committee and that this be laid before both houses. Those in favour say thought. Those yeah, against say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Deputy Butler. Oh. And Deputy Chambers. Oh. Deputy Corcoran Kennedy. Oh. Deputy Brophy. Oh. Deputy Timmy Dooley. Oh. Martin Hayden. Oh. Uh, Imelda Munster. Yeah. Breed Smith. Yeah. Hildegard Nochton. Oh. Tom Neville. Oh. Uh, Thomas Pringle. Oh. Eamon Ryan. Oh. Sean, Sean Sherlock. Oh. Brian Stanley. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> Paul Daly. Oh. Maura Devine. Yeah. Tim Lombard. Oh. Ian Marshall. Oh. Michelle Mulhern. Oh. And Grace O'Sullivan. So. Okay. That's Thank you. So. Thank you. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen, sixteen, sixteen, and one, two, three, four. Three times. Oh, well, so that's all nice piece of work. Mm -hmm. The guard so all sixteen. Okay. Just to conclude, uh, those in favour, Ta is sixteen against Neil, and the question has been carried. On that note, can I briefly just say, sorry, sixteen uh, for, and four against. And just on behalf of the committee, I just want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you who have worked so constructively and positively over the last seven months. I know we were in public session yesterday and today, but I have to say we've worked very well together. I also want to thank the Secretariat, who have done fantastic work, led by, by Ted and all the team. And again, all of this work goes unnoticed, under the radar. The, all the advisors who are sitting in the gallery, who again have done Trojan work, hours and hours of work behind the scenes, who have worked with us all constructively, all parties and non and all the witnesses who came before us, and in particular the Citizens' Assembly. Without their work, we wouldn't be here working on this cross-party report. And I think this is a unique report, the first of its kind, coming out of this Iraq, this in relation to climate change. It is a first step, but an, an important step. And I look forward to working with you all on the Standing Committee. Thank you very much. Well, okay. Thank you. I was just going to say that I I'd like to reiterate every word you said, but I would like, on behalf of every member here, and I'm sure everybody's in agreement, to congratulate you as chair. It's not an easy job. You were always very fair, you were always very balanced, and you drove the committee along in, in, in a nice pace. So I just want to say Thank congratulations you. and well Thank done. Thank you very much. And I, 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 that was yourselves who worked with me, and I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you as well. I think the way you've handled it over the last eight months has been very good, and you've been very, very balanced. Uh, and very, very fair, you know, the way you've let in, you. the way you've handled the discussion and led the committee. Thank you very, so much. very much. I appreciate your comments. Yeah. And let us go yeah. forward for climate change, climate action. Yeah. Thank no, you. Hold, hold, yeah, hold on, sorry. No, sorry. We have to go into private session to agree the terms of our standing committee very briefly. So can we go into private session? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to private session. Thank you.